the Holy Ghost. Well, don't get quiet when somebody says Holy Ghost. I'll try that again. The Holy Ghost. Is he real? Is he alive? Is he living on the inside of you? The Holy Ghost is about to teach you, huh? How to live under an open heaven. Amen. Told me, told me this morning, we've got too many open mouths under a closed heaven. And then at other times, we have too many closed mouths under an open heaven. But I was praying and asking the Lord, why are we seeing what we're seeing in America today? And more importantly, why are we seeing it in the church? He said, because you've got open mouths under a closed heaven. Wow. You ever felt like the heavens were brass? Felt like it didn't even matter what came out of your mouth. So we have a lot of people prophesying. We have a lot of people praying. But the question is, are you praying under an open heaven? You can get more done. You can be seated if you're praying the Holy Ghost. You can get more. I mean, loud enough so it makes your neighbor nervous. You can get more done in 30 seconds under an open heaven than 30 years under a closed one. Say, Lord, I refuse to pray under a closed heaven. All right, I'm going to show you now three keys. Ready? Luke chapter number Luke chapter number three. Luke chapter number three. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of God forever. Utah is joining with us. Ohio, Illinois joining with us. More from Canada joining with us. Big time Burleson, Texas is in the house with us. Hallelujah. How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is something for the body of Christ to be able to come together in such a broad and wide scale that it is no longer a local connection, but there can be a divine connection of faith and agreement around the entirety of the globe. Can you see the connection taking place as it leaps? You remember those old, those old Indiana Jones movies where it would show the plane going from one place to another, but look at the connection of agreement that's going from Red Cross, North Carolina, all the way over to Thailand, and then over into Ghana, and then over into San Diego, and then over into Canada. Canada, then over, I mean, it's just, if two agree as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them by our Father, which I just think something's about to be done for us by our Father, which is in heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why are we facing what we're facing in the United States, but even more particularly, even more interestingly, why are we facing what we're facing in the church? The reason is because we got too many open mouths under a closed heaven. So there's a lot of jibber-jabber that's taking place, but there's not a lot of advancement in the kingdom. And the reason being is we don't know how to sustain an open heaven. We know... We know how to accidentally, you know, we fall into accidental moments of glory, and there we pray and things happen, and we're not really sure how it happened. We're just thankful that it did. Maybe it was the shoes we were wearing, and so I make sure every Sunday I wear my shouting shoes. But it is not the shoes you were wearing. It was the opportunity, an open window. Oh, oh, oh. Are you in Luke chapter 3? I just, I, I, I felt led to go to Malachi chapter 3 for just a moment. Maybe we will in a minute. Maybe we will. Luke chapter number 3. Hallelujah. Are you excited to be in the house of God? Are you excited about learning how to live under an open heaven? The open vision that God has given you cannot happen under a closed heaven. And the, the three basic principles of living under an open heaven you will never graduate from. These are things you must continually apply in your life. But let's go here to Luke chapter number 3, and we'll begin with verse number 21. If you're there, say, I want to live under an open heaven. I mean, Wigglesworth lived under an open heaven. 
Summerall lived under an open heaven. John G. Lake lived under an open heaven. These, Amy Simple McPherson lived, Maria Woodworth Eder lived under an open heaven. These were not men and women who were perfect in their theology. These were people who were not perfect in holiness. Although we should strive for perfect theology and we should, we should strive to walk in holiness. We'll talk about that here in a moment. But these were people who learned to set their hearts towards an open heaven. Now, this is not going to work if you've got your heart set on your need being satisfied. See, an open heaven is so essential because that is when we are seeking for the divine will of God to be accomplished in the earth. There are two spirits, two demonic spirits that are attacking the body of Christ, particularly in the United States. And for those of you watching around the world, it's important for you to believe with us and agree with us for revival in America because what happens in America happens in the world. It overflows. It can overflow in the world around us. And there are two spirits. I wasn't planning on talking about this, but I'm just going to drop it on you. Number one, a poverty spirit. Everybody say poverty. Poverty is a spirit. It is a demonic spirit, but there is another demonic spirit. It is, it is a facsimile of a divine spirit, but there is a demonic spirit. Number two, are you ready? You're going to get this down? The prosperity spirit. In Greek mythology, there was this demonic entity that oversaw prosperity, euthenia. It's where we get the word euthanasia. Euthenia was the demonic prosperity. God has prosperity. The Holy Ghost is a spirit of prosperity. He is the spirit of prosperity. But there is a demonic spirit of false prosperity. And in Greek mythology, it was called euthenia. Where we get the word euthanasia. The reason why we get the word euthanasia is because euthanasia is when you inject something into someone that causes a euphoria that is then preceded by death. In Lithuania, I believe, they built a roller coaster. It is a roller coaster that's designed to kill people. It produces 10 Gs of force for a sustained amount of time that causes the rider to die. But just before they die, they experience euphoria. That is false prosperity. The selfish pursuit of your own carnal gain so that you can feel better on your way to death. That is not divine prosperity. Divine prosperity is the pursuit of sacrifice and the reception of divine abundance for the distribution of kingdom benefits so that we will never die. <laughs> if you don't understand that, you can't live under an open heaven because the selfish soul cannot receive an open heaven. You with me so far this morning? Well, at the same time, the poverty spirit cannot live under an open heaven either. It is to... It is to, you understand, there is no difference. The prosperity spirit and the poverty spirit are both as about as greedy and selfish as the other one is. The rich do not have a monopoly on greed. In fact, more often it is found among the poor. The fear of letting go. But it is the willingness to let go that positions you for an open heaven. Somebody's about to get a miracle today. I'm telling you right now. I'm telling you right now. Somebody's been believing and praying for 20 years for something that's about to break through in the name of Jesus. Hmm. Everybody say, no shortage mentality. Say, no selfish prosperity. 
Luke chapter number 3, Luke chapter number 3, and verse number 21. Hallelujah. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was what? Open. Opened. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Here we see in this verse, leave it up for just a moment, the three benefits of living under an open heaven. Number one, you have Holy Ghost manifestation. When you get an open heaven, you get Holy Ghost manifestation. How many of you could use a little Holy Ghost manifestation? So number one, you get Holy Ghost manifestation. Number two, you get access to the voice. Divine direction. Divine clarity. Number three, you get favor. One day of favor is worth a thousand days of labor. You don't need money. You just need favor. Most of what you think requires money, you could accomplish with a moment of favor. One moment of favor. And they say, you know what? We have canceled. I remember when, when Steve and Gwen were believing for supernatural debt cancellation. They were believing for the money to have their debt canceled. And as a prophetic symbol of that, they took their credit card and they had plastic surgery and they cut it up and they threw it here on the altar believing for debt cancellation. The next day, I don't remember if it was a call or a letter, I don't remember what it was, but they were notified by the creditor that they had decided to forgive their debt of how much? $26,000. Come on, if you can't shout over somebody else's miracle, you're not going to get one of your own. <laughs> what a coincidence. $26,000. Did they need money for that? Or did they just have favor? One day of favor is worth a thousand days of labor. When you get underneath an open heaven, you have access to the divine favor of the Almighty. But let us break down just for a moment, if you would allow me to teach this morning, to talk to you about what it really means to live under an open heaven. Go to, let's, yeah, let's do Malachi 3. We're just going to do it. I'm going to read it. And real fast, I'm, I would promise I'm not going to mention tithing. You can't help but mentioning it, but that's not what I'm talking about. Everybody say he's not talking about what he's talking about. Ma Malachi, I'm over here in Micah, Malachi chapter number three, I don't know if the lighting's in here, if I can even come down there, can I come down there, all right, yeah, but I want, I want people to be able to see, amen, I'm trying to be nice, everybody just pray in the Holy Ghost just for a second. Stir yourself up here now. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. We truly do want to live under an open heaven, regardless of the cost. Help us. Help us. Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 1, Behold, everybody say, look at it. I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver and shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and of silver that they may offer unto the Lord what an offering in 
Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasing unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. And I will come near unto you to judgment, and I will be swift, uh, a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against the and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, before we get into the next passage of Scripture, you need to understand context. What is the great prophet Malachi speaking of here in this passage of Scripture? What is he predicting? Huh? Well, it's quiet. Did I read too fast? Okay. Behold, I'm going to look at verse 1 again. I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his... What, what's Malachi prophesying? The second coming. Now, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Malachi is about to talk about tithes and offerings. This is traditionally looked at as that's old covenant. No. No. Malachi is talking about the tithe at the second coming. So it is, if someone says, I need New Testament on tithing, okay, turn to Malachi chapter 3. What are you talking about? Yep, Malachi 3, because here it's talking about the second coming of the Lord. And Now, the tithe, as it was then, as it is now, will be that way then when Jesus comes. So I got news for you. If they, if they tithed in the garden before the fall, if they tithe, I'll talk about that here in a moment, after the garden, after the fall, if they tithe before the law with the patriarchs, if they tithe before the flood and after the flood, if they tithe then during the law, if they tithe during the ministry of Jesus, if in Hebrews chapter number 7 they were tithing then and at the second coming of the Lord they're tithing, I got news for you today, you got to tithe. Sorry about your luck. I mean, he gave you 100%. Ten ought not be a problem. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church. And just in case you would get confused, in verse number 6 of Malachi chapter 3, he makes this statement. For I am the Lord, I change not. This is the statement. He's about to be silent for 400 years. How many of you believe if you were going to be silent for 400 years, you pay really close attention to what you were about to say? For 400 years, he's about to be quiet, and he's about to take up an enormous amount of real estate talking about the tithe. And just before he mentions it, he says, I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, I'm not talking about the tithe. Everybody say he's not talking about what he's talking about. I'll, I'll break it down here in a minute. I'm not receiving the offering. That's for later. Or we'll do two. I don't know. Norval Hayes would do about five offerings. <laughs> and not one of them was for him. He'd take up an offering for the, for the orphans. He'd take up an offering for the church. He'd take up an offering. Oh, there's a missionary. Let's receive another offering. Dr. Summerall would do the same thing. And if you weren't reaching, by the time you got to the fifth offering, if you weren't reaching into your pocket, they would look at you and say, like, what's the matter with you? <laughs> it's true, isn't it? You were in those services. But I just don't have to say, that's the difference between a giver. A giver budgets in giving. They budget it in. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I knew I shouldn't have done it. Verse 7, even from the days of your fathers you were gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? 
That's a good question. Can you? Can a man, can a man put some pantyhose over his head, stick his finger in his pocket like he's got a gun and go into the convenience store of heaven and rob God? <laughs> What's it talking about? How could you? Can you take money out of the bank of heaven? No. But you can rob him of being God over your life. You can stop him from doing what he wants to do for you. Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, How have we robbed thee? Look at this. In what? Ties and? You are cursed with the curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. I promise my intention today is not to talk about tithing. So I think it's just this is just an added benefit for you. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be what? Meat. Now when we get into the New Testament, and it speaks of meat in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 5. I, 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 I would desire to give you some meat, but you're still on milk. What is meat in the New Testament? Revelation. Yes? Everybody say meat, meat. is revelation. Are you learning something online? Say meat is revelation. Now, interesting, just something for you to kind of set aside to study later, when the apostle Paul, I believe, who's the writer of the book of Hebrews, talks about meat, he's referring to the revelation. He says, I want to give you some meat, but you can't stand it. You're still on milk. He's talking about specifically, look at it in context, the revelation of Jesus being a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. That's the meat. There's only two things we know that Melchizedek did, receive the tithe and pronounce the blessing. So this is the revelation Paul wants to give them concerning Jesus receiving our tithe as our high priest. And he says, that's meat. And it's interesting here, bring you all the tithe of Malachi 3, that there may be meat. A coincidental connection between the tithe and meat? No, I think not. Where are we? Verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that, that y'all were all excited about an open heaven. I mean, you were just thrilled. You know, you'd pray in the Holy Ghost, and yeah, I'm going to get tithe. Oh. I'm not talking about the tithe. The tithe is just a symbol. Okay. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not, what, open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough for you to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse 13, because I just feel like reading it. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken so much against thee? You have said it is vain to serve God, and without profit is it that we have kept his ordinances, that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts. Here, when we're talking about the blessing released in the tithe. We see a striking similarity between what is promised there and what is poured out in the life of Jesus when he goes underneath that water. So he must have been a tither. He goes underneath that water. He comes up and the windows of heaven are opened over his life. Yes? yes. Now, no miracles were done by him until that moment. 
No miracles. Bring me back to that in a, in a minute. Abraham did not see the manifestation of the promise of God, had to wait an extended period of time until he released the tithe to Melchizedek, and then the miracle working power was accelerated, and he gave birth to his seed. Jesus saw no miracles until he submits himself here to the baptism of John on the Jordan River, which deals with the, with the baptism into the high priestly ministry of Melchizedek, another teaching don't have time to go into, comes up out of the water, and then the windows of heaven are opened over his life, and he begins to see miracles. I shared with our dream team meeting this last week, it, it's interesting that when you look at it that way, then you realize that Sarah did not give birth to Abraham's seed. The tithe did. <laughs> you just goodbye everybody <laughs> go home and ruminate on that for a little bit and now we are Abraham's seed we are children of the tithe and so we're the only ones who can truly bring an offering in righteousness who can truly bring the Abrahamic tithe, not the Levitical tithe, not the tithe that happened underneath Moses, the tithe that Abraham, we're the only ones because we are born of that tithe. It is who we are. So if you go back to Luke chapter number 3 and verse number whatever we were on, is it 21? Look it up, look it up, verse, Luke chapter 3, verse number 21. Let's look at it together. Everybody say, I'm going to learn to live under an open heaven. I'm going to learn to live under an open heaven. Luke chapter 3, yeah, 21. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. Verse 22. And the Holy Ghost descended. Everybody say, Holy Ghost manifestation. Holy Ghost manifestation. And a voice came from heaven. Everybody say, Direction said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased, say favor. favor. So let's break this down then for a moment. He, he said, I am well pleased. That's interesting. You need to look at that. So the open heaven is the result of something that Jesus had done. What had he done? There is very little recorded about the life of Jesus up until this moment. In fact, up until this moment, there's really only one thing that's said about him after he's reached an age of maturity where we could look at anything he's done. He's 12 years old in the temple. Yes? So he's 12 years old in the temple, and he's confounding the teachers, and, and, he's, and he's teaching the teachers. And his mother and stepfather leave him and are on a journey, and they realize how many days? Three days' journey. Everybody say, we're going to find him in three days. A day is with the Lord a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. We are entering into the third millennium since Christ. We're about to find him in three days. So Jewish people lost him at the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the uh, they lost him, just like Mary lost him. But on the third day, they're going to find him. And guess where they're going to find him? In the temple. So there's a prophetic allusion there to end time eschatology you can look at. All of the parables of Jesus, as a matter of fact, you could probably find a prophetic illustrations of what's to come to pass in the last days. But that's something that we could talk about at another time. They find him in the temple, and he said, don't, don't you know, there's something you can learn here if you want to find Jesus. Don't you know I would be about my father's business? You're not going to find him in a place of desperation. If you're looking for Jesus, you want to encounter him. You must go to a place where the father's business is being accomplished, and there you will encounter the presence of Jesus. So know you not that I must be about my father's business. And they said, boy, what's the matter with you? Can't see on the camera. I was whooping like with a switch. No, I doubt they whooped him. I mean, you think they probably didn't whoop Jesus. I mean, it's not even your boy, you know what I mean? You know, how you are with other people's kids, you, know, you can't really whoop them unless you have direct permission to whoop them. Is this strange talk for you millennials and Gen Zers and <laughs> the alpha generation? Everybody say, whoop them. I mean, whoop them good. Well, if they don't deserve it, whoop it just in case. They did something you didn't know about, just whoop them just in case. 
for what I didn't know you did. Whoop them. No. <laughs> My daughter's just sitting there smiling. Like, yeah. <laughs> and they said, boy, what's the matter with you? Come back. Come home with us. I mean, I'm sure you would have been concerned. Yeah? You lost Jesus. Some of you have lost him. Tell by the look on your face. You look like you spent the night upside down in a post hole. You lost Jesus because you lost your joy. You lost your strength. You lost your passion. Everybody say, it's time to get Jesus back. So the Bible says that Jesus had an open heaven because of something he did that pleased the Father. Well, what did he do? Well, Luke chapter 2, verse 51 will tell you what he did. Luke chapter 2, verse 51, open it up. Luke 2, 51, pull it up on the screen for everybody. I mean, we want to see signs and wonders and miracles. Here's what it says. Luke 2, 51. I'm guessing. Pull it up. You, who has it? Who can start it for me? And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. Where did Jesus want to be? In the temple. Where did his parents want him to be? With them. Which did he obey? His own desire or his authorities? This story is given to us so that when we read about the open heaven, we have something to reference. Pleased. So an open heaven is the direct result of the pleasure of God. That when we please him, he opens heaven. And when he opens heaven, then we have Holy Ghost manifestations, signs, wonders, and miracles. When he opens heaven, we have direction, divine direction. When he opens heaven, then we have supernatural favor that comes on our lives. How did he get an open heaven? Subjecting himself to authority. What kind of authority? I don't know. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Real quick, pull it up. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Quick like bunny. Whoever gets it first wins my respect and admiration. Chapter 2. Let me see it. 1 Peter 2, 18. There it is. Servants. Oh, don't call us that, Pastor Allen. I got news for you. You still a slave. You just got a different master. He's a whole lot better. A whole lot better. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good ones. But, Pastor, you don't know what they said to me in children's ministry. Not only to the good ones. I know Kathy. She can get ornery. <laughs> There is zero, zero truth to that statement whatsoever. <laughs> Everybody say, open heaven. An open heaven comes from, oh, hallelujah. Number one, number one, sonship. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Everybody say sonship. I'm going to give you three keys to an open heaven. I know it's not usual for me to have three points in a poem. I don't think I have a poem, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> Number one, sonship. An open heaven is a blessing of inheritance that can only pass from a father to a son or a daughter. Everyone wants an inheritance, but nobody wants to be a son or a daughter. A son or a daughter differs from a servant for a variety of reasons. And benefits, certainly, because they get the inheritance. But a son or a daughter differs from a servant or a worker because you don't get to choose your authority. Many of you are servants, in a sense. You serve on your job. Yeah. We tell people in the military, thank you for your so they serve and sign up to serve, and they do not get to choose who they're serving. 
whoever the drill sergeant is over them, that's who they're serving. And that type of service is the kind of service we're talking about here. You don't get to choose your parents. Yes? Everybody says, I'm talking about spiritual, spiritually. I know you know that naturally. I'm just talking about spiritually. How many of you know you could like a church and you like the children's ministry and you like the praise and worship, but it's just, it just doesn't feel like that's where I'm supposed to be. Then you could be in church and you don't like the children's ministry and you don't like the praise and worship, but it's like, Dad, gum it. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, regardless of how strange you are, I need you. We're family. We're family. You see the difference between fa- It's just like God brings you to a place or connects you with a ministry. With all other ministries, you must chew on the meat and spit out the bones. You can navigate that relationship. You can negotiate that relationship. But when it comes to the place where God places you in the body, there's no negotiation. You have to deal with the people who are around you or else you will remove yourself and weaken the body. Like tents holding up a revival tent. Tent pegs. Someone's like, well, I'll try over here. And so we fasten and secure a part of the Holy Ghost tent that God and revival that God has called us to do to you, and then you decide, whoop, I want to be over here. And then the tent comes down. We've got a whole lot of you are floating tent pegs. Now, sometimes, there are seasons where it's necessary. You know, the Lord's, you've got to find how else you're going to find where the Lord's called you to be. I'm just talking about over a 20-year period, you know. Floating tent pegs. I believe God is about to take. You remember the story of Barak and Deborah? And who was, the, who was that cat they were going after? Sissy something? Cicero. Sissy. <laughs> Cicero. They were going after Cicero. Did they get Cicero? Or did some housewife who had a tent peg. God is about to overthrow the enemies of this nation, not through the mega ministry, but in your house. Right there in your house, God is about to use a common housewife to turn the nation around. Everybody say, God, use my house. Is your house available for him to use? Oh, I didn't mean it that way, Pastor Allen. I just meant, you know, come on my time and on, you know, on your dime. Or I told you there'd be a poet, poem in there somewhere. <laughs> Everybody say sonship. sonship. Isn't this such a fun message as you want, you want to learn how to live under an open heaven? Well, here it is. Number one, sonship. Number two, here it is, obedience. Obedience. I want you to write down these two words, a moral choice. A moral choice. We look in the Garden of Eden as Adam and Eve were created there in innocence. Everybody say innocent. They were innocent. They had not yet been given an opportunity to choose between good and evil. That's the reason why a child is innocent. It has not yet had the opportunity, nor does it have the mental capacity to make that decision. It's, there's pure innocence there. So Adam and Eve, in their innocence, are given an opportunity to step into holiness. You see, innocence is not holiness. Holiness is power. I'm just, as I'm talking through these things, I'm realizing that like each one of these little points is an entire sermon all by itself that we could take some time to really, really pour into you. Ho- you are seeking power, manifestation of the Spirit of God, divine direction, and supernatural favor. That is the result of holiness. I know it's not a popular message in the church today, but the Bible still says that the banner over us should be holiness. Holiness is not something that is imputed. 
Righteousness is imputed to you. It is granted to you. It is given to you the moment that you believe. You are in right standing with God. You are at that moment, the moment you're born again. You know what happens when you're born again? You become perfectly adjusted to God. Everything gets shifted and you are now innocent. But you are not holy. And he said, be ye therefore holy for I am holy. He said that in the New Testament, quoting the Old Testament. The old transferring over into the new. Everybody say, holiness is power. So how do we attain holiness? Moral choices produce holiness, which produces power. So in the Garden of Eden, they are innocent, but they are not yet holy. And so he places in the midst of the garden a tree, a tree that they must bestow their labor on, but they cannot eat the fruit thereof. Sounds an awful lot like the tithe. In fact, if you place a tree in the middle of a garden, it must be planted first. Everybody say first fruits. So it's planted first, it grows first, it produces fruits first, and you work it first, but you can't consume it or enjoy the benefits of it because it's God's first fruits. So we have that in the Garden of Eden. No law, no patriarchs. The perfect splendor of the creative design of God, and there's a tithe in the middle of it. Not... I feel led to eat this tree. I just, you know, whatever I'm led to eat, that's what I eat. What happened when they got that mentality? You see, here's the thing. Here's, here's this transfers over into the tithe because, see, when we bring into the new kingdom, Jesus is the second Adam. And so we're brought back full circle, redeemed. God's bringing us back to Eden. Where we are born again, we're perfectly adjusted to God, we are now innocent. And this is why the tithe is, is so important, not because of the 10% as if God needs your 10%. It is, it is a moral choice that causes you to step into holiness power. And you make a multiplicity of moral choices every moment of every day. Do I watch that on television? Do I say that? You are presented with a choice, and the choice you make determines whether you step under an open heaven or a closed one. So the, the concept that, well, I'm going to pray about what I give is the, is the perfect depiction of how they fell in the Garden of Eden. It's a perfect depiction because they were given authority, and as we say in the New Covenant, we know we have freedom, we have liberty. They had absolute freedom and liberty. Yeah, they had absolute freedom. If you want to understand the liberty we have in the New, look at the liberty they had in Eden. They had authority over everything. They had freedom. They had liberty over everything except one thing, themselves, and that's what we forget. Adam was given authority over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, over every, all the creeps, <laughs> the cattle, the fish, everything. He was not given authority over himself. You do not have the authority to choose what tree you're going to eat and what tree you're not going to eat because this tree. Now, if you want to fast a tree over here as you're led, if you want to give that over to me as a free will offering as you're led, that's fine. But this tree is mine. Don't touch it. The moment that you do, you will die. Well, I stopped tithing and things didn't fall apart. Well, how long did Adam live after he did that? Death entered immediately. It took about a thousand years for it to be manifested. Wow. So you can enter into rebellion and experience euphoria. Because when you decide to rebel against the voice of God, it brings an instant peace because you're no longer battling the enemy. You have conceded. And so that peace can be misinterpreted as favor. Samson said, well, I shook myself before. You follow along with me? 
If we want to walk in power, we must walk in holiness. And if we're going to walk in holiness, we must recognize that we are going to be presented with moral choices. And the purpose of that moral choice is not always sent by Satan to get you to fall. Sometimes it is sent by God to get you to excel and to step into glory. And if you will begin to recognize every time temptation is brought before you and you have life and death set before you, if you recognize it as an opportunity to step into power, you will feel so much better about the decision you make when you decide to do the thing that glorifies God, that you will get further and further away from that temptation until it ceases to exist. Okay. All I had were two lines right here on obedience. Everybody say a moral choice. My right to myself has to die. I don't have a right to myself. Spiritual maturity is not measured in years, but in obedience. So obey more often and more quickly, and you'll live under an open heaven. God's not asking for perfection. He's asking for a heart that seeks to obey him more often and more quickly. Everybody say, obey. obey. The final, final point here today, it doesn't get any better. Everybody say, sonship. Say obedience, say submission. How is that different? Submission is an act of the heart. Obedience is an act of the body. It's what you do. It is a carnal, fleshly act. But how many of you know you can do something, you can obey, and your heart not be in it? You ever told your children to do something, and they shrunk, slunked off or whatever to do it, and they were doing it with a bad attitude? There's still a problem. What's the problem? I'm doing it. The problem is you got an attitude. There's rebellion in your heart. Well, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I don't understand. Submission is the joyful appreciation of the authority that God has placed over your life, no matter whether they do good or they do bad. I'm not talking about somebody does something immoral, illegal, or unethical. So I told you to rob a bank. We're not talking about that. I'm assuming we're talking to people more mature than that, and they understand the distinction there. We're talking about the joyful appreciation of the authorities that God has placed in your life. Obedience is an act, but submission is an attitude. And you cannot wield an authority you are not submitted to. Write that down, write that down, write that down, write that down. You cannot wield an authority you are not submitted to. The power to bind and loose went to the church, the unified body. In unity, people submitted one to another. Submission to authority, young people. This is the only commandment that is given with a promise. Obey your parents. That your life may be long upon the earth. The refusal to allow your heart to yield to this will shorten your days. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. So check your heart. Someone can tell you to do something that is even morally wrong, and you not do it, but you not do it with a submissive heart. What are you talking about? Someone could ask you to do something. They say, go rob that bank. You should not go rob that bank. But neither should you harbor bitterness in your heart toward that person. See, submission is a heart attitude. I'm not going to do that, but I love you. Because all that's doing when you, when you, the angst and the anger and the frustration, all that is is drinking poison, hoping it hurts the other person. It's not going to do any good for you. Everybody say sonship. Say obedience. Say submission. You cannot wield an authority you are not submitted to. Oh, here's another good one for you. For you to get down and get in your notes and never forget it. The devil will respond to you as quickly as you respond to your spiritual authorities. Let's go to the next one. 
Well, I need to pray about that. Okay. And then when you tell the devil to go, guess what he's going to do? He's going to pray about it. <laughs> I remember Jesse Duplantis said, Dr. Lester Summerall called him, said, uh, why don't you come speak at my camp meeting? Jesse Duplantis said, I'm so honored. Thank you so much. Let me pray about that. And Dr. Lester Summerall said, I already prayed about it. <laughs> what do you need to pray about it for? Jesse Duplantis said, well, I never thought of it that way. Then, yeah, I'll be, <laughs> I'll, I'll be there. <laughs> It's like, that makes so much sense. I can't believe I never thought of it that way. <laughs> it's, tr it's true. It's true. How you respond to your authority. What God is doing, not to one another. Forget authority. One another. Everybody say one another. I know husbands like to use that verse, wives, submit yourself therefore unto your husbands. But it, it also says, submit yourselves one Oh, you left that verse out when you were quoting it. So we're not just talking about authorities. We're talking about one another. And when you detach yourself from the body, you remove your capacity to submit one to another. So I'm not going to work with them because I don't like the way they work. You have detached yourself. Can't do that in boot camp. Sorry. Boot camp can't do it. You know what happens as a result of that? You have people who hate each other for the first few months, and then they become a friendship that most people would never understand because they didn't get to choose. And when you push through the angst and the frustration, and I don't agree with this, and I don't like, the, I don't like that shirt. I do like that shirt. And I don't like your shoes, and I don't like that beard, and I don't like the way you talk, and I don't like the way you walk. I don't like the way y'all do this. So you'll never understand the camaraderie of the foxhole. You'll never enter into relationships that cannot be broken. And in that, a unity that God commands his blessing on. So in reality, the freedom we have in the United States to pick and choose, we have a buffet of churches, you know, really is hindering the unity. Did you know that arranged marriages have a lower level of divorce than non-arranged marriages? And when polled, often they find arranged marriages have a higher level of satisfaction when polled. Why is that? Because choice is taken out of the equation. When you remove the option of division, that division is no longer even an option. The moment that gets taken out of your mind, now all you have is your ability to make this thing work and your willingness to make it work. The body of Christ is about to enter into an open heaven through a divine unity. But it's only going to come upon a remnant that can push past those things. I've known these people for I don't know how many years. <clears throat> Decades. We haven't always agreed. We have disagreed vigorously. <laughs> Some of you have relationships like this. Probably family. And the reason is because you can't choose family, so you've got to figure out how to make it work. And in figuring out how to make it work, you move past the differences. <laughs> you know? Most of the time. You move past those differences. How many of you have relationships like that? You know what I'm talking about. That they just, now, now that we're past it, there's not even anything you could throw in there that could, because this, you think you get frustrated with people. This is what the Son of God endured on the earth. He has people that he's submitted to that can't even tell when he's in the caravan. These are morons. I mean, compared to Jesus, how many of you think you're probably stupid compared to Jesus? Okay, yeah, yeah, I qualify. I qualify. The Apostle Paul 
He receives a revelation, gets knocked off his horse. Before he's knocked off his horse, he's probably one of the smartest people on the planet. Knocked off his horse, then goes into hiding for three years where God takes him up into heaven and teaches him about the church. Sometimes he didn't even know whether it was a real person he's talking to or a spiritual person. He doesn't know if I, is this in the flesh, is this in the spirit. And after three years, then God sends him Barnabas to pull him out of that euphoric experience because as much as you know about church, as much as you know about children's ministry, as much as you know about worship, it is useless until it is applied in the grind of the relationships within the body. So he has a revelation of church, but he ain't in it. There's a whole lot of people like that. They all know better, you know. They all know better. Well, then if you know better, get your fine self in the church and make it better. So Paul has all this, and he submits. He's not even the key leader. He goes to this church, and he has to submit for several years to these Gentiles. Always, They're always using kind of these metaphors wrong, and they don't understand the Hebrew, and he just has to sit there and nod his head and submit to the authority of the house until he is sent. And then when he is sent, he becomes the Apostle Paul. He had a revelation, but the revelation did not produce an open heaven until he yielded it to sonship, obedience, and submission. God is about to forge new relationships in your life. And they will often be the relationships you wanted the least. But if you will submit to one another in those relationships, when hard times come, they will serve as an ark of preservation for you that will raise you up above the difficulty and provide for you an open heaven. And when you realize that, you understand the urgency behind Jesus saying, love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you, you fools. I can love you. You ought to be able to love one another. Everybody stand up on your feet. We're going to yield to this right now. Whether we want to or not. Everybody say SOS. SOS. Sonship, obedience, submission. Just taking submission by itself calls the Mormon church the Mormon church. 14 million members strong. Or it might be 74 million. I forget what the number is. 74,000 active missionaries in the Mormon church right now. And here's what they have. They, Mormons work separate jobs. They work full-time jobs. They have an average of four children per household. And they go to four services a week. They volunteer eight hours a week. And if they have youth, they often go to youth at 5 a.m. every morning. <laughs> and you're like, a Sunday night service? Everybody say, it's time to shift this thing. So we see why we're often falling behind, why we're often struggling, because we have open mouths under a closed heaven, or we have closed mouths under an open heaven. When God begins to pour things out, we're too busy with our stuff because we're not operating in sonship, obedience, or submission. Every head bowed, every eye closed, and every hand lifted in this building, this is the sign of surrender. This is the sign of submission. They're already saying online, I submit. I submit. Lord, I submit to your will, to your way. I'm not talking about to an individual, some cultish allegiance to an individual. I'm talking about loving one another as Christ has loved us and yielding to one another and allowing that love to produce a unity that commands the blessing over the house of God that breaks out into society in revival, healing, deliverance, and supernatural manifestation of God. Father, we come before you today and we repent for not loving as you've called us to love. Help us, Lord. 
let this mind be in us which was in Christ Jesus also. Help us to love one another. I, I sense something now in my spirit. If there's been any, put, the, put your hands on your belly just for a second and, and just worship the Lord and thank him. Just thank him, thank him for the opportunity to enter an open heaven. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunities you'll present before us. There'll be moral choices. The moment we leave this building, before this day ends, we'll be presented with moral choices that could lead us into power if we make the right choice. But, Lord, today, if we have ought against any, if there has been any bitterness or unforgiveness, it could be from anything from your childhood or something you're dealing with in your in your marriage or in your family or on your job, if there's anything in you that you feel like you need help, you need the Lord to get this done, to get this accomplished, to get this healed on the inside of you. When I say three, I want you to raise your hand in the air. One, two, three. Raise in the air right now, right now, right now. Yes. 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 All right, now begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Give me my dream team up here. We're going to take care of business. We're going to take care of business. And there's nothing wrong. If you're on the dream team, then just stand with somebody else here on the dream team and begin to pray with them. Listen, bitterness and unforgiveness comes for us all. You will never escape its battle, but you can get victory over it. You can't stop it from, you can't stop it from flying over your head, but you can keep it from building a nest in your hat. That's what we're talking about here. There's no condemnation. It's just time to be free. It's time to be free. When I say now, if you need prayer, every, every head bowed, every eye closed, if you need prayer, come down here. Come down here. We're going to stand in faith. One, two, three, right now. Come on down here. Come on down here. We're going to stand in faith. Come on down here. Yeah. Come on. Come on. And those of you dream team, gather around them. Come on. And go ahead and begin to pray with them. Go ahead and begin to pray. Gather together. Gather together. If you're out there in the audience, just put your hand on someone's shoulder. And those of you watching online, begin to pray over them in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. By the power of the Holy Spirit and through the agency of God the Father, we release forgiveness into your heart right now. As you repent in this moment for harboring that thing, we release the peace of God into your heart right now, right now, right now. This will not hinder you from walking under an open heaven in Jesus' name. Yeah, lay your hands on them. Lay your hands on them. Lay your hands on them. Lay your hands. Come on, pray for just a minute. It's about to break. Yeah, one of the comments is, as an ex-Mormon, I miss that dedication. Thankfully, I found ECC, and you teach it and walk it, and I'm blessed by it. But it took years to find it. We're thankful we found you. And in the name of Jesus, I repent to you for not demanding more of you, because I believe you would have risen to the occasion. But I commit to you from this moment forward to demanding more of you. And I believe that as we rise up together, we'll see the glory of God, the manifestation of the presence of God and the peace of God in the mighty name of Jesus. Woo! Take a minute. Take a minute. Somebody go hug somebody and tell them how much you love them and need them in the body. Yeah, I forgive my family members. No matter how they feel about me, I forgive them. I love them in the name of the Lord. I forgive them not because I feel it. I forgive them because I've decided it. I've made the decision to forgive. Everybody say, I've made the decision to follow Jesus. It doesn't matter what I feel. I am walking in sonship, obedience, and submission, therefore, I'm under an open heaven. I receive manifestation, divine direction, and favor.
Well, take 30 seconds and celebrate it and thank the Lord for it in faith right now. Woo. Now, you're about to be presented with a moral choice. It's time for this morning's tithes and offerings. Hallelujah. Come on, those of you that are watching online, you can be seated. Those of you that are watching online, go to EncounterToday.com and give in obedience to the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. That is the glory. He desires obedience more than he desires sacrifice. And the key is finding a group of people who will not just obey the Spirit, but who will obey the Word of God. And when you go, take advantage of the special offer. And just to thank you, we'll send you two signed copies of our book, Armed for Victory. I think that's going to end this week. That special offer will end this week. Two copies of Armed for Victory signed, sent to you for a gift of any size. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. So take advantage of that before it's gone. Also, as you're getting your tithes and offerings ready, the Armed for Victory Media Conference is almost here. Woo. We're about to train a handful of ministers here in Charlotte, North Carolina, how to take their media to the next level, entrepreneurs, Christian entrepreneurs. If you believe that God wants you to use media in order to impact this world, then go to armed.media, www.armed.media, and you've got to register now. We got the extension for the 30% discount on the hotel room, the events in the hotel. The hotel's 10 minutes from the airport. You get your plane ticket, you get here, or you drive here, and you don't have to go anywhere. You don't even have to rent a car. There's a shuttle. The hotel will give you a shuttle from the airport to here. And come and be with us for three days and learn how to take over social media for the kingdom of God. www.armed.media to register for that event. And you've got to register if you want to be a part of it. So go take care of that. And don't forget to leave a review on Amazon if you've had a chance to take a look at the book. It makes a huge difference. Now, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give today. Everything we have is because of you. Everything. And so we submit ourselves to you by taking what our time, our energy, our effort has produced, and we offer it to you. And we pray that it's pleasing in your sight. Through this act of obedience, I thank you that you'll open the windows of heaven. And for us, at a blessing, there'll not be room enough for us to receive it. We glorify you in it, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, everybody said Amen and amen. Give us unto the Lord as the ushers come to receive your offering. Those of you watching online, thank you so much for being with us. We love every single one of you, and we'll see you next time. Come on, let's hear it for our online audience.